Well, good morning. It is a real joy to be back with you today. Uh, always good to see the old faces and always the new ones as well. Um, so thanks so much uh, for the opportunity to be able to be with you, even if you had no choice in the matter today. Um, but we're just here with my family. Uh, Jenna is my wife, and that is our oldest daughter, Aria, Colette, Eden, and Silas as well. Uh, we're pictured there with my mother-in-law, who's um, in her final days here with us. Uh, this was just uh, three weeks ago she was able to stand, and now she, she can't talk or move or anything. And so we're just trusting that God's going to take her soon to be with him and to be healed. Um, so you can see, thank you so much for your prayers as we continue to head in that direction. But we're serving in Strasbourg, France, um, and so it's a joy to be back with you all today. I think this is actually the place where I understood how to not just understand uh, relationships, but live them out with other men in our lives. We had some amazing accountability groups. We got to know Jesus in profound ways, um, and it's where, where I began to discover that and experience that reality. And so I pray that's still the case for you um, as we continue to, to benefit from it, and that's what sent us uh, to France. And so we're living in Strasbourg, France right now. Move forward, what's that? There we go. Um, so this is uh, the city of Strasbourg uh, where we serve. Uh, the two, or, or the little red dots are all the evangelical churches in our city, right? A city of about 350,000 people. Um, and that's how many evangelical churches we have. And that's with a large definition of evangelical. Um, and those two churches are the ones that we planted with my French colleague, uh, Arnaud, and myself, we planted the second church. And all of these neighborhoods over here on, on the west side, these are all, oops, sorry about that. These are all uh, Muslim evangelical, or Muslim um, multicultural neighborhoods uh, that are comprised majority of majority of, of foreigners and, 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 and asylum seekers. Uh, oh, and then on this, up, up on the right-hand side up here, this is where you have your kind of elites, the upper class of society. And so just interesting that the two most neglected parts of the city are the rich and the poor and the marginalized. And so God's put that on our heart, uh, the marginalized, and so that's where we're headed. And so we planted this church just um, three years ago, and we're slowly but surely getting ourselves on our way after COVID, and God continues to do a good work in us, and so in us as well as through us. And so our goal is to plant a church in all the Muslim neighborhoods uh, without an evangelical church in the years to come if God grants us that opportunity. So thank you for being a part of that ministry. I'm going to come back to that actually a little bit later in the middle of the sermon to share a little bit more about what God's up to, but just kind of wanted to give you that, that first glance. Well, this morning, um, I don't know how you all feel on a, on a daily, monthly, uh, or even annual basis, but just because I live in one of the most beautiful countries in the world, uh, and just because I'm a missionary, doesn't mean I have more spiritual resources than you, right? And so I wake up often probably asking the same questions you do, like, am I going to be able to make it another day in following Jesus just today? Or, or, or how much is my sin, both the stuff that I know about and the stuff that I don't know about, really impeding me from going deeper with Jesus? Or even the fact of the reality of, does our church really have what it takes to respond to some of the needs in our, in our neighborhood, let alone our city? And is the church really even a, a solution or a part of the solution? Because, man, she's really messed up right now. <laughs> the church is really broken as we look around the world, and we're just kind of struggling to see, is this really possible? Right? And we can get really discouraged, and so it's kind of like this massive puzzle piece, right? Uh, these puzzle pieces, and it's kind of like you're putting this big uh, puzzle together, and, and you're on the sky portion, where it's just a bunch of blue pieces, and you're like, well, how does this all fit together, right? And you're just lost in the details, and you can't see it anymore. And sometimes we get overly focused on our sin that we actually forget we have a Savior. Sometimes we get so focused on how two hours on a Sunday morning, uh, how the church runs on, on those two hours, that we forget to be the church the other six days and, and 22 hours of the week. Right? All these different things begin to happen. And so we forget that there's a king and that he's writing a story and that we get to be a part of it. Right? That we forget that there's this king and he has a kingdom. And, and so we, we, we forget that this world's not just a ticking time bomb where one day the world's going to just explode like the media leads us to believe. Right? That's not the case. God is setting up his kingdom, and yet it's so hard in the midst of everything going on in our world right now to see it. We get lost. And so this morning, we're going to go back and look at what Jesus says the kingdom is like in Mark 4, 26 to 32. Um, and so he's going to remind us what the kingdom is like and how we can participate in this 10 million piece puzzle project that he's a part of. We get this little piece in it, but he invites us into that process. And so it's, it's frustrating, though, because he doesn't really define the kingdom for us in one phrase in Scripture. Right? He just gives us images uh, and pictures of what the kingdom's like. And we're like, okay, Jesus, come on, 
keep it simple for stupid here, right? Like, just help me, help me get my mind around this thing, right? And so Dallas Willard has a, a good definition of it. He says, it's where God gets done what he wants done, right? Very, very simply, we could say that. It's where God gets done what he wants done. But to reduce it just to that makes us miss a lot of things. We're like, okay, so that's good, but what does that look like? And that's why Jesus gives us images and pictures to be able to understand it. And so we're going to look at Mark 4, 26 to 34 to see what this looks like. And so I'm going to be uh, a really good um, Baptist preacher this morning and give you five eyes. right? The kingdom is important. It's intentional. It's independent. It's inevitable. And ultimately, it's incredible. That's where we're going to head this morning. And so let's read with, uh, with us to Mark chapter 4, verse 26 to 32. And he said, the kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. He sleeps and rises night and day, and the seed sprouts and grows. He knows not how. The earth produces by itself first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. But when the grain is ripe, at once he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. And he said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God? Or what parable shall we use for it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which when sown on the ground is the smallest of all the seeds in the earth. Yet... When it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants and puts out large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. This morning, we're going to look at these two images in a little bit more detail to see what it is. And first of all, we're going to look at the fact that it is important, right? The kingdom of God is important. And so... It's interesting because we're going to start actually with the end of the passage, verse 32, to see where we're going. It's kind of like when you're putting the puzzle together, you have to have the photo on the box so you know where in the world you're headed, right? We're going to head to the end to see where this thing is ultimately going. And he says it's actually this massive tree where birds of the air come and take up residence in the tree. And we're like, what? Jesus, I don't see the connection between trees and kingdoms, right? And it's interesting, though, because actually what he's doing is he's going back to Ezekiel 17, where this massive tree is produced through a little sapling. It's cut off and it's planted, and all of a sudden there's this massive tree that is built up, and, and it says that, that the birds of every type come and dwell in its branches. These birds are actually images of all the different nations, all the different peoples that are going to come and dwell in the kingdom tree of God. And in the context of Ezekiel 17, God is actually judging the people of Judah because they were running after smaller kingdoms. And if you have time this week, you can read through Ezekiel 17, but there's two little trees that pop up that are, that are images of Babylon and Egypt. And Israel was being uh, in captive at this time, and so they wanted to run to Egypt to get help to be able to survive the oppression of Babylon. And, and God is just like, you're running the wrong direction, right? You're doing an Adam and Eve on me, and you're, you're just like they walked away from the tree of life, you're walking away from me to lesser kings and lesser causes than my own. And how much... Are we exactly like that? That we get caught up in lesser causes, lesser kings than him. We get caught up in the cause of our personal identity creation, right? That's just a big thing in right now, right? To project an image, to kind of manage people's expectations of ourselves, to, to appear presentable, and to be able to kind of manage this. And so all of a sudden, everybody else becomes my functional king because I need to manage how they view me, right? Or, or our families, when, when, when things get reversed and, and, and there's, it's our kids who become kings sometimes, or, or it's the parents who are kings, but really they shouldn't be either. Actually, Jesus is king. And, and all there's these, these unhealthy dynamics that take place in our families, or in our marriages, where, where men or women are acting as kings when they're servants of each other and of the king. Or we could talk about our workplace, where our boss becomes the king for us. And it's kind of like we have to do everything to appease him because his affirmation is more important than anything else. And so we're just trying to, to climb the ladders. We're trying to get the appeal and the affirmation from him when really it comes from, from King Jesus. There's also our social lives, right? Where our friends become our kings and what they want and what they like and, and what, what, what social media likes. That's what we're going to become because we want to fit in. We want to belong. We want to matter somehow and let's not forget our country and its president who becomes a form of a functional king right all these different kings and causes that that we're looking to to give us meaning and purpose and all of a sudden they hijack god's bigger massive agenda of his kingdom and so this is why we have to be very careful to keep god's kingdom central to our thoughts often when we talk about salvation we don't think about kingdom 
Right? We talk about a lot about I'm saved so that I'm forgiven, right, for my sin. Or, or I'm saved so I have power to, 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 to make good decisions and, and do good things. Or, or, or I'm saved uh, into a new way of life, into a new religion or a new relationship with God. Or, or I'm saved into a community where we get to do life together. And all those things are good, but the kingdom goes above and beyond all of that and englobes it in itself. And it's so much more than just that. And so when we signed up to follow Jesus, we've entered into a kingdom where God rules, right? And this makes the kingdom absolutely important because we have a really hard time as Americans to kind of get our minds around this, right? We, America was built on the premise that we don't want to be ruled by a foreign king or queen, Right? We just celebrated, 4th of July, right? We want our independence. We don't want to be ruled by anyone. Don't tread on me, right? This is, is our show, and we get a voice in it. But when we signed up to follow Jesus, we entered into a kingdom reality, right, where God rules. And this makes the kingdom very important for two reasons. First, the kingdom is not just about you, but it's about the whole world, Right? The kingdom is not just about you and your relationship with God and your forgiveness and your walk with him, but it's about the whole entire world. At the end of scripture, we don't see one person escaping the world and living with God forever. No, we see the whole world renewed with people from every tongue, tribe, and nation gathered together under King Jesus, worshiping him. And so we're not just, the kingdom doesn't come just to heal our alienation from God, but to heal all alienation. Right? It's so much bigger than me, but yet it includes me. It's crazy, right? And so God calls us to stop navel-gazing and to open up our eyes to him and to see what he's doing around the world, to heal the alienation between me and him, between my neighbor and him, between each other, right? Between us and our own ways of understanding who we are and with creation. And so God wants to have this kingdom that's much more bigger than us, but the whole world. And secondly, the kingdom's not just about you, but it's about God. It's about the king, have you ever noticed how much in our conversations we tend to have, uh, in our conversations about faith, they, they often come back to me. They come back to us. And how often do we actually cast our vision to God? Right? At the beginning we talked about how often we look at our sin and we forgive of a Savior. Well, one pastor said that for every uh, one glance that we have at our sin, we should have ten glances at Christ. Right? We have to get absorbed with the Savior who came and died for that. And so many things apply to that. And so when you enter into a relationship with the king, it's not just that you get stuff, though that happens, but you enter into it because it's his due. It's his right. It's what Psalm 100 verse 3 tells us. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Right? We often talk about what we can do and not do for Christians and, and we try to get to the limits of what's in the kingdom or not in the kingdom as opposed to pursuing his heart and his agenda for everyone and ourselves around us. But friends, we don't get to negotiate with the king. Right? That, that's not how king relationships work with servants. No, you don't ask him to fit into your agenda, uh, your agenda, but you bow, right? You bow down, you kneel, you give him your sword, and you let him knight you, right? And you trust him with the sword in his hand to put it right next to your throat where he could kill you, and you say, you know what? I know you're a good king, because you didn't stay on your throne, but you got off it. You went and died on a cross, and you're a good king, and I trust you not to abuse, you, me, abuse me or misuse me, right? And that's how we can trust the king. That's how we can let the kingdom be important in our lives, because we know who he is. And so when, when he's king then, in that context, all of a sudden, your sex life doesn't belong to you anymore. Your money doesn't belong to you anymore. Your identity creation project isn't yours. It's his. Everything begins to belong to him because he's king and his agenda is more important than all things and all people. And so the kingdom is important. It's not just a hobby, but it's this reality that shapes everything that you do, the way that you do it, and all that you do. And so this is the end goal of the kingdom. This is where it's heading, right? This is our longest point this morning, so hang in there. Don't think that all the points are going to be this long, okay? This is where it's heading, it's this massive, all-important reality that invites us to situate ourselves under it. And if we don't begin there, we might as well just chuck the rest of it, right? Because it doesn't matter if it's not important to us, right? So, so we're sitting ourselves under this all-important reality of the kingdom. And so now we're going to go back to the beginning of our text. And this is where we're going to see the second point, that it is uh, intentional. The kingdom requires intentionality. 
And so what's interesting is that this parable, which I've got to be careful with this because it only spends one verse talking about this and maybe even not. But subtly it's there, right? This is definitely not the focus of the parable, but Jesus shares it nonetheless that a man gets up, goes out to the field, and sows some seed. It's not a massive role in the arrival of the kingdom whatsoever, but it is a role that takes place and requires intentionality. And so on our church planning team, we took time at the beginning uh, of, our, of our project to, get, to be uh, to set our hearts and minds on God's agenda, right? What is God's kingdom agenda? And, and where is our, our neighborhood broken? And how can the, the, the kingdom agenda of Christ come into those areas and bring healing and, and, and restoration? What does God want to do there? And so we sat down together to do this to be, okay, like if this is important, it's going to reshape our priorities. So we need to be intentional. And you had people that were in all different kinds of engagements. You had people that work full-time, part-time, uh, and full-time in ministry. And it was just like, how are we going to do this together? And how are we going to hold each other accountable to be intentional with the resources and relationships God's given us? And so we broke it down into six areas. I like images, so yeah, this is, this is what we came up with. This image of farming. Right? We've got this farmer who is dwelling in Christ. Right? His heart is, is dwelling in Christ. He has God's heart in himself. He's dwelling in him. And then he enters into the field. He enters into a relationship with non-believers to begin to, to then sow the gospel and bring it to bear. And something absolutely miraculous happens right here that we can't control, and God brings a harvest. Right? And discipling begins to take place. We say, how are we going to do that? How are we going to continue to grow as a church and be discipled? And then how are we going to gather? What does that look like to do that well? And then how are we going to train each other so we continue to be sent in this continuous process? And so what I want to do this morning is just kind of share a little bit about what this has looked like practically for our church so that we can celebrate our collective intentionality, right? Because you as a church have decided to be intentional by putting money aside, right, to be intentional to serve God's greater kingdom purpose around the world and not just in Xenia. So what we're going to look at is just some fruit of what God has been doing, right, and celebrate that together. So first of all, oops, dwelling in Christ, right? I, uh, I came to a point two years into this project where I realized that my zeal, my gifts, and my strategies were not going to be enough to sustain me in the kind of ministry that we were faced with, right? So I had to face up against sin, injustice, poverty, and the powers of darkness in the Muslim world, and I realized I needed to go find a new well to dig from, right? Or I had to redig and re-understand who Christ was for me. I couldn't depend upon my own resources, and so God has been a process of just kind of shaping me and teaching me how much I need to get alone with him more and more. And also that I need people around me. And we didn't have many people that were with us, and God sent us a family recently. He also sent us a mentor. There's a guy who got kicked out of Turkey as a missionary, and now he's in Strasbourg, and he's been mentoring me. And then I have relationships with people that I just need to dwell in Christ, right? We need these things. And so God's brought those people along. But as we dwell in Christ, then there's an overflow that allows us to, to give something away. And so this is why, as a church, collectively, we decided to open up a cafe that's called Le Quai 67, which means uh, Platform 67. We're in the train station neighborhood of our, of our city, and so it's the platform of the train station where the nations are coming. Uh, we did a study, and there were 67 different ethnicities that live just in our neighborhood alone. And so we wanted to be a platform where the nations could come and experience community and Jesus. And so we opened up this cafe uh, finally in August. We've had a lot of up and downs, uh, but we're open right now as, as it is. And we're watching God begin to help us begin to have relationships with people in our neighborhood. And then that results in, in sowing the gospel. And so we wanted to meet some needs in tension in our neighborhood, but we also wanted to share Jesus pretty clearly. And so we started up some language classes in French. We have 23 um, migrants who are in our, in our French classes, and 13 of them now have uh, a language partner in our church. And so the goal isn't services and programs, but it's people. And so we really wanted to have a place where people could interact with Jesus and Jesus' people. And so now 13 people are beginning to walk towards Jesus. We had an Afghani lady that showed up for classes uh, back in September. And just a couple, uh, just about a month ago, right before I left, uh, she came to class and the teacher was really frustrated because nobody had showed up to class that day except this one lady. And she was just like, okay, well, I'm not going to do the class. We're just going to go have coffee and tea and, and chat. And this lady began to share a story of suffering uh, of how she came out of Afghanistan and how she got into France. And she said, I know that God exists because I see all my suffering, but I know he's there anyway. But I just don't know who he is. And she goes, several times during our classes, you've talked about God and, and Jesus. And I just want to know, like, who is he? And, and do you know this God? W would you be my guide? Was the, was the question that she stated. People are just thirsty for Jesus to meet them in their suffering. 
And we're just watching this happen over and over again, right? And so we're so in the gospel, we got this Eritrean guy who's meeting with one of our future elders in our church, Andrews from South Africa, beginning to share life to help them with physical needs and getting so many opportunities to begin to build into their lives the good news of Jesus, to demonstrate to them what Jesus has done for us. That's what we get to do on a daily basis, right? We have after-school homework help for kids that are from all over the world, opportunities to begin to share the gospel there. We also have uh, those desserts there. Actually, my wife took over some dates to our neighbor. It's a Lebanese family, and they came back with that. So I'm excited to keep sending them over stuff to see what else comes over. Um, but but beginning these relationships and sharing the gospel and making it clear to them who we are and just beginning to see these seeds get met, sent, and to see what God's going to do with it, right? And so as we sow, we then get to see God do something miraculous, right? All this is just us trying to be intentional. But the, re- the rest, this is what God does. Right, this is what happens uh, a month ago when nine people choose to follow Jesus. We had seven Iranians, a Turkish guy, and our daughter choose to follow Jesus in the waters of baptism. Right? Their faces are blocked because they could die for trusting in Jesus. Right? It's nuts. We, we've watched God do some incredible things. This is Pastor Muhammad. I'll get to share a little bit with, him, with you later about him. But Pastor Muhammad is this incredible Iranian man who wants to see Christ uh, present in Strasbourg. This is our, our small group, one of four of them. And this is where we really begin to be able to follow Jesus together, and we're watching things grow and the gospel grow in people's hearts as we become fluent in sharing the gospel with each other. But then we also gather. This is our church on the top right. Uh, We have people from about 10 different countries around the world, and we're about 40 people, 45. Um, And this was our COVID uh, church gathering space, and God has been continued gracious to teach us how to walk with each other, how to express diversity in, in this new context. And so it's been a really great privilege to do that. And this is the Iranian church I was talking about earlier with Pastor Muhammad. Pastor Muhammad came to me and said, I, I want to plant a church. And he had just become a Christian three months ago, right? This was two years ago. And I said, well, maybe it'd be good for us to maybe study scripture together and, and that kind of stuff. And so we, we contacted Southeastern Seminary, who has a Farsi-speaking seminary, where he's now attending classes online and getting trained in, in, in Bible theology. It, and the guy's just an evangelist. He shows up at a train station and just starts sharing the gospel, and two people convert, right? There are now 30 people that are gathering regularly. They started in a park. They're now in a Catholic church that no longer has any Catholics in it. Um, so they meet in that church, and right after them is the Afghan mosque. <laughs> so uh, it's crazy what God is doing in this crazy city, but Pastor Muhammad has been definitely influential in that process. And so we're hoping to see more of these congregations grow together. And lastly, it's training. Uh, our church is Eglise Perspective. Uh, that's our church on the bottom left. We're learning to train up elders. We've got two guys in the process, and we, Lord willing, we'll move there in the coming years. Uh, also, I get a chance to, to teach at the Bible Institute in Geneva, Switzerland, where we're training Francophone workers, French speakers from all over Quebec, Canada, um, uh, Belgium, Switzerland, and France to send them out to work uh, in the harvest. And also with Acts 29, we're working with them as well in West Africa. Many of you know that we were in Ivory Coast uh, before, and I still get to go back on a regular basis. And now we started up a church planner training program with these three couples. Um, these three couples are going to be going to three areas of Cote d'Ivoire, to work with three unreached people groups that have no access to the gospel. No Christians, no Bibles. Well, there's one Bible in the one people group, um, but that's it, right? And so they're going to now go and, and begin to, to begin this process. And so December, I'll get to go out and visit them in their context and see what God is doing there. And so thanks to our collective intentionality, we get to watch God do stuff secondary, tertiary to us, right? Third, third degree removed from where we are sitting just because we chose to be intentional. And so God just wants to continue to do this process through all of us. And so I share that to celebrate what God is doing, but also to help you begin to think, so what does this look like for me? How can I be intentional with the resources that God has given me? Right? And some of us here today are like, okay, we've got to go do some stuff. Right? And I'm like, hold on. Right? Don't, don't, don't just start doing stuff. Right? Because, because a lot of times we start doing things, we're just doing to, to feel better about it, but not actually thinking about how do I do this well? And also, there's others of you that are sitting here today like, my agenda is packed. I, I, don't make me do anything more, please. Right? I, I can't keep adding things on. And that's not the point this morning. The point this morning is not to, to, to do more things, but to do everything you do with kingdom intentionality. Right? Just to do what you're already doing just differently. Don't add new things on. Just think, how am I going to dwell on Jesus? Right? Every summer I sit down and I plug in, just God, what do you want me to do? Who do you want me to invest in? And how can I do that with just everything that already exists without adding new programs or activities on? 
And then every month I go back and visit and say, okay, how's this going? Right? And sometimes I even take it from, from, from these people's names and these things that I put down. I, say, I put it into a calendar and say, is this even physically possible? Right? And I just pull back and say, can I do this physically, concretely in my daily life? And so oftentimes we just want to do kingdom things or turn on kingdom service when really it's supposed to be something that invades everything that we do. We're always engaging the kingdom. And I think sometimes we look at the Christian life and we think it's just like these massive decisions and I have to respond to the big ways when really we only have a couple handfuls of really big decisions in our life and the rest of it is millions of little decisions in everyday life. How am I going to react? <laughs> Imagine if the kingdom started to invade our reactions in relationships, on social media. Imagine what that would be like. That would be insane. All these little moments we have decisions and actions that give us an opportunity to display the love and grace of Jesus. And so how can we be intentional with where we're at right now? And so the goal is not to be crazy intentional and get after things right away, but it's to slow down, right? And think what does God have for us. And so it's a, if it's important, then that means we should be intentional, right? And if it's intentional, then thirdly, that means that it should also be independent. The kingdom is independent of our intentionality. Almost the whole part of this first image is focused on how the seed grows and becomes something incredible apart from the intervention of the farmer. Verses three, three out of four verses explain how the kingdom grows independent of our activity. And so this is, uh, this is crazy because it's not that we do nothing. No, we're invited to participate and to be intentional, but only God brings the growth. Verse 28 says, the earth produced by itself. The word is automate in Greek, right? Automatically automatically, apart from human intervention, God gives the growth the whole way until it becomes a grain and is ripe for the harvest. And then what do we do? We come in and we cut it off and say, yeah, look what I did. No, that was God's work. We just showed up and planted something. He did something miraculous. We show back up and we act like we did it, but really it was him. It was completely independent of our activity. It's absolutely crazy. You know, my girls, they, they love to garden, thanks to their mother. Uh, I hate dirt right? Um, and, and so they're always planting seeds. And it's amazing that these seeds grow because they overwater them and they're touching them every day, right? I'm just like, how is anything ever going to grow uh, at this point, right? But they happen despite them and uh, even um, uh, because of them. And it's unbelievable that these seeds continue to grow. That's exactly what we have to be reminded of as, as followers of Jesus, that God is the one bringing these things together. It doesn't depend on my strategies it doesn't depend on my programs, our services, our methods, but the reality is that the power of the kingdom cannot be contained to any strategy or method or intentionality on my part because it always surpasses it, right? And so, yes, God uses our strategies, but he is always up to something much bigger and in, 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 in beyond what we are doing. So, yeah, we need to continue to preach the word. We need to continue to extend uh, converse, uh, mercy and compassion. We need to serve our neighbor, neighbors and love them towards Jesus and obey King Jesus in all of life. But at the end of the day, we need to go to bed and we need to rest often knowing that he is managing his kingdom right well. And so some of us, if you're like me, we need this word, right? We need this word because we are activators. We want to do stuff, right? We just need to slow down and remember he's king and not me. Others of us need to be intentional. And others are still trying to figure out, is this even important for me right now, right? So these are things that God wants to do, and the image that we use in our church a lot is, is that of a sailboat. And we want to be intentional and lift up the sails, but it's not going to move one single inch unless the wind of God blows. The spirit, which means literally the wind and the breath of God, has to blow for this to happen. And a lot of us, like me, when the wind doesn't blow, the sails are up, I've done everything in my power, I grab the row and I start going after it, right? Who's like me? Am I the only one? Okay, good. Yeah, a couple honest people. It's good, right? And it's dangerous. It's dangerous because you get exhausted and so does everybody else around you, right? So remember, the kingdom is independent of our efforts. But when we get this, when we actually appropriate this from time to time, then what we begin to see is that because it's important, because we're intentional, and because ultimately it's independent of us, it is ultimately inevitable, Right? Verse 29 says, but when the grain is ripe, at once he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. Right? The harvest has come. It will come because it is not dependent upon us. The harvest of the kingdom 
is inevitable. And yet we look around us and we struggle to see the kingdom. Personally, I struggle every single Sunday to see the kingdom in Strasbourg. I hear the church bells ring because there's tons of churches. The reform happened there a long time ago, and now they're all empty. It reminds me of a conversation I had with a Muslim, Muslim radical in front of our house one day. He said, Justin, why are you a Christian? Look at the churches. They're all empty every Sunday, right? They're either empty or they're museums. You know, clearly, the, the Christianity is dead. It's got a weak king. Jesus wasn't enough. But look at the kingdom of Muhammad. Look at the mosques every Friday when they gather. They're packed. We're building the largest mosque in Europe in the neighborhood just next to us that's going to go up in, in just a few years. It's unbelievable. Look, look at what's happening. Look at the kingdom. It's great. It's working. And look at the kingdom of Jesus. It's pathetic and empty. So yeah, I look around my city and I struggle to see the kingdom. And I, and I hope we are asking ourselves, why doesn't he just do it already? God, why don't you just show up and do something? You said you're going to do it. Just get after it already. And I hope I'm not alone in that. Right? And I know, I know that there was a lot of other people in Jesus' life that weren't alone in that as well. Just look at Jesus' mother in Cana of Galilee when Jesus does his first miracle. She's like, turn the water into wine. Show them who you are. Bring the kingdom. Hey, Mom, it's, it's not yet my hour. It's coming, but that's not my hour. And then the hour shows up, and what is it? He's hanging from a cross with a crown of thorns on his head. And what's happening? People are mocking him. Right? He saved others, but he can't even save himself. Right? He's the king of Israel, suppose. Let him come down now from the cross, and we'll believe in him. Imagine the disciples were saying the exact same thing. Jesus, you better show up. And on Saturday, they were absolutely destroyed when he didn't. Their king was a fraud. His kingdom was a failure. And they're asking the same questions we are. Where are you at? But thankfully, on Sunday morning, he marched out of a grave and began to show us that he is king. Right? That the seeming failure of the kingdom actually comes through sacrifice and suffering. And so friends, take courage. The kingdom is coming. It will come, despite who is president, despite the COVID variants and disasters that are going to arrive in these next months, despite your internal struggle with sin, but despite your external struggles with certain relationships in your life right now, he's going to show up. The kingdom is going to come in and even through all that chaos that is all around us and that's even in us. That's where he wants to bring it to bear. Because the kingdom broke through the chains of suffering, sin, and death on Sunday, 2,000 years ago, we have hope that one day it will ultimately break through finally and fully. He's going to wipe the slate clean and fix it all. It's inevitable. It's like in France, we celebrate the day of victory. Oops, there we go. Beaches of Normandy, the, the Americans and Canadians come flying in to help the, the, the French who have been invaded by the Germans. On June 6, 1944, they all arrive. Germany kind of loses, and they wave the white flag, but not really until 11 months later is when it finally collapses. And for 11 months, there's skirmishes, there's fights, there's all sorts of things happening, and they're just waiting. <laughs> I thought we won. But there's all this stuff that keeps happening. In this in-between time, it's, it's just, it just images and fights and outbreaks of war of, 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 of a regime that refuses to bow the knee to the fact that it lost. And that's what's happening now. We're in this 11-month period that's been lasting for 2,000 years now, right, where the kings won and the world is just responding. All, the, all these chaos that we see is just the world saying, we don't want to bow the knee to the king. But they've lost. It has lost. The agendas are going to go. Jesus has already won. We just have to continue to be intentional and to keep the important kingdom on the forefront of our minds because it is inevitable. The king is going to come through. Jesus is going to come back and set up his kingdom forever. And that allows us to keep being intentional because we know he's going to do it. Because we're going to keep putting up the sails because that's all he calls us to. We can't make it different. All you can do is be intentional to submit to King Jesus and watch him work when he's ready. And so when that happens, lastly, we begin to see that the kingdom is absolutely incredible. It's incredible because of verse 31 and 32. It says, it's like a grain of mustard seed, which when sown on the ground is the smallest of all the seeds on earth. And when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants and puts out large branches so the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. And what is incredible about this image is not how big the tree is. The fact that it's this 12-foot tree with large leafy branches but the fact that this massive tree has such small and humble beginnings. 
The smallest of things sometimes brings about the greatest of ramifications. And so how is it, we struggle because, like, how is this big kingdom possible to be seen in these really small things? Is Jesus running around and telling stories about the kingdom and showing hospitality? Is that really the kingdom? But that's what he did from boats, from houses, from dirty streets, right? From the middle of nowhere places, he launched the kingdom in that way. And so let's be careful of worshiping greatness and bigness because it can be big and wrong. (laughs) It can be big and well, but it can be big and wrong, but it can be tiny and be incredibly impactful. And so sometimes we have this feeling that we're just impotent and insignificant because we don't have the titles, we don't have the positions, we don't have the full-time work that we can want to do. But God wants to use all of our weaknesses to do something that just doesn't make sense. He wants to bring life out of death greatness out of smallness, healing out of brokenness. This is what we see in Jesus' life. John 12, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. How's he going to show his glory? Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. The glory of the kingdom comes how? By a grain of wheat dying to bring life. This is the workings of the kingdom. Something has to die for something to live. And so what's crazy, though, is that the reality of the kingdom is that Jesus, he's the seed that died to bring us life. He became a man, actually a baby. Before that, he was an embryo and actually a single-cell seed that ultimately gave life to this thing that we continue to experience 2,000 years later, right? It started in an incredible way. He didn't become a large tree and impose his kingdom, but he laid on a tree and died for us, Right? He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness under King Jesus. So I don't know where you are at today. I don't know what you're struggling with, what you're fighting against, or how you're seeing God at work in your life or not. But what I do know is that God is setting his kingdom up in us, through us, and even beyond us today. Right now he's doing it. And so the question is, are we embracing these realities of the kingdom? Do you believe the kingdom is, first of all, important, right? Or are you wasting your life on lesser kingdoms this morning? And this isn't a one-time action. This is a continual action of coming back and saying, God, help me to desire your kingdom. Help me to want to want it because I don't, right? That's maybe the starting place for some of us this morning. Secondly, are we being intentional with our lives? How are you dwelling, sowing, entering, discipling, gathering, and being trained for mission. What does that look like for you? Take some time with your families, with your spouse, with your friends, with your small group, and say, how can we hold each other accountable to do this well in this next year, right? Sometimes a year is overwhelming. Just say, next three months, here to December, what what are we going to do to be intentional? Thirdly, are we trying to bring in the kingdom independent of God as if it all depended upon us? Right? (laughs) I get there a lot, way more often than I would like to. As one pastor said, sometimes our best deeds are our greatest sins. Right? Sometimes the best things that we do, the kingdom services that we do, are sometimes the worst things, our greatest sins. Because it's more about us and our usefulness. It's more about us being seen and noticed. And it's not really about the person in front of us. And it's surely not about Jesus. So what is the status of your heart this morning as you serve? Right? What is your heart motivation as your service is taking place? Because are we doing it before God and with him? Or are we doing it before men and with our own resources? It will be disastrous if we continue on that track. Fourthly, are we holding out hope in the midst of our chaos and struggle right now that God's kingdom will inevitably come forth? Some of us have to have this question today. Where are you tempted right now to just let go of hope altogether? God wants to meet you there, and he invites you to bring that situation, that relationship, that struggle to him and to each other as a church, and to say, God, come let your kingdom show up in this space. Where is that for us today? And lastly, are we embracing the incredible truth of the kingdom that God delights in using small, broken, weak, and imperfect people like you and I to do things that allow the beauty of Christ to shine in through us for a broken world around us, right? Friends, the extent to which this is true for each of us individually 
will be the extent to which it's true for us collectively. How often do we say, I wish my church was like this? Well, are you being that today? Right? Our church can't be collectively what we're not each being individually. So all of us have to do this. It's not like this church does this and, and I just kind of watch it happen. No, collectively, we have to ask ourselves, so these are the realities and dynamics of the kingdom in my life and in our life so we can see the kingdom take place in our neighborhood. And so as we continue to root these realities in our minds and our hearts, we can lean into Jesus and we can lean into each other to cry out to him and say, may your kingdom come, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this morning, the chance to sit in a, a text that is not just words on a page, but it's a power that comes to us through the person of Jesus and makes it possible through the Spirit to be lived. We don't have to, to just cultivate some energy, think harder, do more. We need to receive your love and let it come into our hearts and through our lives that your kingdom can be demonstrated. Father, I just pray that you would just help us this morning not to just, having, having, having heard all this, this stuff, this, these ideas, Lord, that you just take one or two of them and you just allow us to do business with you about that topic. God, that you would just begin to bear fruit in the way that you want to do it. God, I pray that, that I would stop speaking and that you would start speaking in the hearts and lives of, of each of us that are here this morning. Hear me pray. Amen.